There it is. Um, yes, so I'm now going to uh, hand across to um, Paul Pangaro, who's going to be giving us his talk on countering code with code responding to the pandemic of today's AI. Thank you, Dee. Thanks very much. And thanks to all of the graciousness of the IS to the American Society for Cybernetics. And also thanks to Jen Marker for being wonderful teammates. Um, and thank you all for coming. Uh, my goal today is to talk about countering with code. It's a rather specific idea. It's still in formulation. And it's intended to uh, respond, as the subtitle says, to the pandemic of today's AI. The title of the conference, of course, is uh, The Art and Science of the Impossible. I, I've sometimes been accused of wanting to achieve the impossible, so I, I feel very comfortable here. And uh, perhaps you'll see why I reference that now. Uh, but I assure you, I'm a pragmatist. I'm not an optimist. I stand here in, in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. It's a sunny day. I'm at Carnegie Mellon, as Dee said. And I hope to persuade you that something can be done. And I will tell you what I think that needs to be done and why. And offer a way how to do it and how the how fits the what. Uh, by the way, these slides, if you wish to follow, can be found at the link below, pangaro.com slash IS 2021. You can also get it from my homepage if you're interested now or later. So first, the definition, uh, not just the definition of pandemic, but uh, more than that. You may know that the word pandemic, pan, all, Demos, Greek word for people. Uh, but in the context of pandemic and demos, it doesn't just mean people, people. It means people in your neighborhood, people in your community, people you're in touch with. And for me, this word describes what the internet and digital devices are doing today. Four billion people. <laughs> Sounds like everywhere to me. Um, and today's AI is inside of the technology that we touch every day. And my feeling is, and I'm not alone, is that today's AI foments all kinds of nasty things, polarization, capitalistic purchase of products, social bias, and it's surveilling, of course. I'm not saying all AI is bad, but I'm saying today's AI, as it is everywhere, is not a good thing. And the impact is growing every day. So what about this? What uh, might we do? Well, these are the things that AI is doing. And ultimately, it's making the world we see and the world we live in. And my worry is that human purpose is lost. It's in all of these systems and more. And of course it works with code, right? It's all software. And part of my argument is that code is a codification of values, points of view, biases, all kinds of things. And that that's what's inside our machines and with AI inside, this has caused a pandemic. So that is my setup. The structure of the talk is mostly this diagram, which comes from Hugh Doverly and some colleagues. And I'll just talk about it briefly. It really is the outline of what I'm gonna be talking about. You'll see in the lower left, what is? So what is the existing, perhaps implicit, although I just tried to make explicit, what's going on in the world, lower left quadrant. It's discrete, it's concrete, and I've described it. So that's the first step of what I've just done, essentially. Now where I'm gonna go is I'm going to expose what I feel are the concepts and the values, the codification that underlie today's AI. And from there, I'm going to counter with alternatives and then speak to what I think might, what I hope would bring about a preferred future. So this is the outline. 
I've described the initial conditions, if you will, the current situation that uh, I believe needs attention, and I'm not the only one who says that. And so now the question is, what do I mean that there are concepts and values that underlie today's AI? What are they? Well, my feeling is that the digital technology itself has created a kind of culture. And that because machines are smaller, cheaper, faster, and are everywhere in the hands of 4 billion people, for example, that we have a dominant culture of the digital landscape. And that's happened largely because of the smaller, cheaper, faster of the many decades since the 60s. It's seductive, massive computers with massive volumes of data have given today's AI, and of course, machine learning would be the way to qualify it, but everybody thinks of AI today in technical terms as machine learning. I didn't say that right. Today's AI is machine learning, not all AI is machine learning. Right? The technology is massive data and massive compute. But the siren call of digital technology, I think is irresistible to technologists who are enthralled by the power of computing, to users who wanna live their lives. Well, wait, we want to live our lives. We want to live together, I hope, in better ways. And the technology promises efficiencies, right? Time, resources, optimization of goals, personalizations of experience. This is fantastic. Don't we want all of this? However, the problem is that the values I claim that are inherent in the code, the codification, are at odds with being human. So I'm claiming that the digital technology creates a culture that is focused primarily on what computers can readily do rather than something else. Right? So it's this digital culture that I think is causing, helping cause the pandemic of today's AI. So what are the assumptions of digital culture? Well, I claim that it assumes that interaction is mechanistic. I don't think I have to explain that, right? It's a machine, right? Every gesture or action by you or the machine is well-defined, ambig unambiguous, and it even expects a predictable response. It's predicting me. Now, AI's interaction involves that idea that I'm getting input and I'm responding. And we'll be contrasting this in a few minutes with an alternative. Now, it also suggests that information is objective. So every fragment of data, all them zeros and ones that become words or images or whatever in pixels, it's interpretable by anybody in multiple contexts as if it's all the same. So information in quotes becomes a commodity that can be captured in binary data and reused fluidly, so-called as if. Thirdly, Digital culture assumes that intelligence is a process that sits inside a computer, right? So what the computer knows is what's important, what's held inside. It doesn't matter so much that it's connected to something, but rather that it's smart, smart home, smart fridge, smart computer. And there's little or no recognition to the contribution or value of the coupling or what's outside and the relationship of those of the system and its environment. So therefore, it assumes that human behavior can be generalized and predicted. The consequence of having interaction as mechanistic in the digital, in the digital culture is this. Similarly, if you offer the same option to many, many different people, it has the same meaning. And as you might expect, machine prediction is intelligent on its own. So we don't have to question it. We don't have to say, wait a minute, I'm not sure about that. By the way, who's doing the assuming here is a topic all its own. But let me move ahead with some examples. You all know Google PageRank, right? Google gives you a result, but you can't ask why it gave you that result. Well, you can ask what its ranking algorithm uses. Oh, it uses reviews and recency and this and this and that and that. But that doesn't tell you why it's giving your answer now. YouTube up next, it queues up the next thing for you to look at. 
as an algorithm that's trying to optimize engagement, trying to keep you there, trying to hold on to you no matter what. But you can't question it. You can't say, why'd you give me that? And you can't say, well, give me something a little different than the following that. Similarly, the Facebook feed, you can say, no, I don't wanna look at that. You can mute people, but you can't define the things you want. It's making a lot of assumptions. It's deciding for you. So these aspects are the consequence of the codification. And this codification enshrines values that control outcomes. Now, let me give you a specific example. I call this fondly the parable of Luigi's pizza. And if I'm in an interactive environment, face to face with people in the same room, I ask someone to say, Paul, ask me where there's good pizza. And they ask me, and I say, I'll tell you where. The best pizza is right across the street of Luigi's Pizza. And then I say, now ask me why it's good pizza. And they say, Paul, why is Luigi's the best pizza? And I say, screw you, I'm not going to tell you. And they jump. And people in the audience go, mm hmm. And then I say, I just described Google. Because it doesn't tell you. It doesn't tell you why. So what's in the slice that it gives you? What are you getting? What is the technology deciding for us? How does that come from digital culture and what are the consequences? Well, we'll talk about some of the consequences. So my premise is though that it's not the technology, right? It's how we fashion it. It's, it's what we make it into. Right? And in pursuit of profit, the big bag of worms right there. We build these engines and they dazzle us and they addict us and they get us into doing things that we may not want to be doing. But this is not the only option. I claim that we can shift technology from the digital assumptions that I went through, interaction, information, intelligence, back toward our analog roots, our physical selves, our organic and biological and social selves. So can we make such a shift in our algorithms back to being human, back to novelty and choice, transparency and conversation? And can these become the core principles of a new AI, of a new today's AI? So this is my counter. My counter is to upset the dominance of these, don't you love this phrase? pernicious algorithms, we must design and propagate a new set, a humane organic set. And right now I'm calling it analog interactional frameworks. Don't love it, has the right flavor, not necessarily a, a, a bumper sticker. We're working on that though, believe me. So what do I mean by that? Well, let's look at this idea of countering the culture of digital with the culture of analog. So a little sidebar here on digital versus analog culture. We know that digital culture is binary, right? Zeros, ones, nothing in between. Well, of course, you can have a lot of zeros and ones in a, in a really wide word, as it's called. And so you can get gradations from zero to a million. It's not quite the same, though, as being biological, being, being biological. Binary, of course, also implies inert. As I was saying earlier, you've got a piece of data, the data is static. That's, that's what we need and we can purvey it everywhere. But if we're biological, we're fluid in many senses. We're able to change. We wish to change. We want to know who we might become. Similarly, you could argue that digital culture is inflexible and analog culture is malleable. mechanistic versus humane, and ultimately transactions focused, right? That's why the digital culture is there. There's that capitalism thing again, right? Wants us to buy things or interact, wants to keep us engaged such that it has our minds 
and ultimately our attention and perhaps our pocketbooks. But in an analog world, we want conversations because conversation is the capacity to become new. It can be an exploration of possibilities. It's staying fluid and malleable and humane and social and responsive. So the problem as I see it is the digital culture has overtaken the analog culture and it's kind of wiped it out, at least in the technology. Yes, you can talk to your friends, you can do all those other things, but the dominance is still there and I have a problem with that. But the two cultures are fundamentally different, right? They don't equal one another. There are some advantages in digital, right? We want the flexibility. We don't want equivalency, right? We wanna maintain this difference. But we want a, what I would call an appropriate recursion. We want an interaction, we want a constant fluidity, if you will, back and forth, kind of metaphorical circling through to keep what we want as analog creatures, to take advantage of what we can and don't sacrifice from doing from the digital side and then to come back again. But how do we do this? Where do we start? Well, it won't surprise many of you I think we can start from cybernetics, but why, right? I have to justify this. Now I'll show you very quickly some slides that I don't expect you to absorb. And again, I go to my homepage, you can pick out these slides and, and look at them in more detail if you wish. But you know, cybernetics has been all over neural nets and AI for a long time. So cybernetics is not new to the party of neural nets. Neural nets is machine learning. Neural nets came before AI, AI came after cybernetics, et cetera. I, I'm sorry, I, let me simplify this, okay? Very, very simple. Cybernetics and neural nets arose in the 1940s. So-called symbolic AI came up in the 60s, mostly forgotten. A lot of students I know say, oh, symbolic AI, oh yeah, that's that old stuff, that's not relevant anymore because we can do everything, well, anyway. Erasing, erasing history doesn't help. Expert systems, remember those? Yeah, well, they also came and went. But neural nets resurged in the 80s. And then when big data and massive compute power came in the 2010s, it came over to be overwhelming and it became today's AI everywhere in our lives. But cybernetics is different. I don't think I have to argue that, right? So how and why does cybernetics move before move us forward i say came before ai so it has a certain has props right it embodies the art and science of purpose of systems well that's very interesting organic biological systems have purpose right trying to do something trying to get somewhere trying to decide what to do and where to go so it's about not just the current intentions but future intentions It offers detailed models of regulation, right? Manages to the degree that they can be managed, complex adaptive systems, but it, it embraces the unknowable and the unpredictable, which is like where we are today, hello? <laughs> you know, got a lot of unpredictability and un unknowability out there. It also brings an ethical imperative. If you're familiar with Heinz von Forster's ethical imperative, this is a reference to that. And it was founded as transdisciplinary or antidisciplinary. So it's covering an awful lot of bases, right? And it applies across all of the disciplines. So these are the reasons for me that I can say, hey, let's bring cybernetics forward in the context of today's AI. Right? I'm looking to give you the support give the people on the other side of this divide between what, what we're talking about and perhaps how AI might react to this, the proverbial uh, embodied AI. Remember, we've got a big problem here, right? And so we can bring the big guns of cybernetics, I think, to pandemics, 
such as the pandemic of today's AI, because it's a wicked problem. Um, are there alternatives to cybernetics? Mm, well, these things haven't worked. Not going very well, right? So come back to the countering to this idea of analog interactional frameworks. If we bring forth algorithms, counter proposals to today's AI, I believe we can begin to have a positive effect and better serve the social fabric of what it means to be human together. And we can start from cybernetics. So earlier I made this comparison between digital culture and analog culture. Let's look at these individual terms and unpick them a little bit. So if digital culture says interaction is mechanistic, cybernetics offers that it's conversational, interpretation, response, openness to other contexts, other understandings, right? Cybernetic interaction manages the unexpected and the unpredictable. Digital interaction doesn't do that. Information, instead of thinking of it as objective, can mean the triggering of ideas, triggering in the sense of Maturana and Heisman Forster and Task, that it doesn't come into me as information, a fact, some zeros and ones but rather triggers what I have experienced and what I already know and opens new possibilities. There's that idea again, you'll hear that from me quite a lot. And thirdly, intelligence is relational. I'm sure you know the actor, John Cleese, who was being interviewed once. And at the beginning of the interviewer, the interview is completely funny. Oh, Mr. Cleese, you're a very, very funny man. And Cleese frowns. You won't have any of it. He says, no, I don't think of it that way. It depends on who I'm with. So in the same way, being a funny person, being intelligent, it depends on who I'm with, right? It's a relationship. It's not the smarts in the machine, it's the connection between the machine and you that is either intelligent or less so. This is the way I like to think about these things. And this becomes prescriptive, these in the best sense. These ideas of reinterpreting interaction, information and intelligence become prescriptive. Can we make replacements to today's AI and bring about a preferred future? Well, you remember Luigi's, what might be the alternative? So instead of a lack of transparency of intent in Google, for example, when you can't say, why did you give me that? What if you could say, why is it the best pizza? And it tells you just the way a friend would tell you, Paul, you need gluten-free, it's got gluten-free, um, sustainably sourced, it's a pleasant atmosphere, and they're open now. So from the philosophical to the pragmatic, from the political to the everyday, you can ask it a question and it will tell you. Similarly, asymmetry of control of focus. You can't question it, similar. You could say, you could ask, does Luigi serve gluten-free? If it didn't tell you that when you said, why is it the best? And lastly, can you open up this conversation for new choice and suggest back and forth what might work? It's like any negotiation you do with, with someone else. You collaborate to decide Instead of it deciding for me, what if I can decide in the context of this collaboration? So this would be the codification of analog, I claim. And as you'll recognize, I'm talking a lot about conversation. So back to this idea of a preferred future with analog interactional frameworks. Can we bring these positive things forward? Where to begin? Well, I hope you're thinking of ideas. I suspect you're thinking of ideas I haven't thought of. Those of you who know me won't be surprised with my first suggestion. It's not the only possible suggestion. 
But there's a body of work of which this one example, Colloquy of Mobiles, I think is the most amazing. This is a bunch of robots hanging from the ceiling and interacting with each other, originally from 1968, as this says. And a colleague of mine and I, TJ McLeish, reproduced it. And the experience of reproducing it is outside the scope of today, but you wanna talk about analog. <laughs> Yes, there are 11 digital processors in there, but the experience is analog. It's a beautiful example of digital machinery creating an analog experience. Why is it analog? It's analog because it's serendipitous, because they're cooperation and competition, because they'll do it amongst themselves, or you can come in and make noise or use a flashlight to attract their attention with light and sound. This appeared at Central Pompidou briefly. And this is all, of course, from Gordon Pass. In a sense, the king of analog interaction. King's not the right phrase, but colloquy of mobiles. They're autonomous agents that converse and cooperate. Sounds analog to me already. And there's this bilingual sensibility. I owe this phrase to uh, my colleague and partner, Karen Kornblum. It's, it's doing both at once, human and social, machinic and digital. The information triggers a response, but it doesn't determine it. It's not those aspects of information and interaction that are digital, it's rather analog. The possibilities begin when something comes toward you as a trigger. And the intelligence is, not, is in the interaction, not standalone. It's not in the machine or in the human, right? And this, I'm happy to say, is, is its current world. It's at ZKM in Germany, where it's part of the permanent collection. But it doesn't have to be modern. It can be, again, from the 70s, 70s, call it from the 60s. This is Thought Sticker. If you want to talk about analogs, there's a lot of analog stuff going on here. But it was a very sophisticated conversation in relatively crude hardware and software, again, from Gordon Pass. It was conversational. The idea was that the human started from something they knew and was led to something they didn't know in a way that was respectful and open to their own, the human's own limitations, curiosity, uncertainty. You don't need old analog equipment to do this. You can get a $100,000 AI workstation, and you can reproduce the same ideas in digital form, resulting in an analog codification. You can put it in modern form, you can stick it in a browser today. Again, novelty and choice, transparency in the conversation under the human's control. It's not that it's digital that is the problem, it's our sensibility, our codification is the problem. So I'm offering an analog alternative. So bringing about this preferred future, how do we create and promote these analog interactional frameworks? So again, forgive me, it's a slide with a lot of stuff on it. I'm not asking you to read it and consume it now, but one could make a plan. And this is a plan. Find examples and in individuals who want to have the conversation, decide what's out there by way of AI, what are they doing, what could we do instead, and establish this new paradigm, and how can we code them? Let's code them. Let's get students and designers and companies and startups to code these things. This is my hope. It's not to maximize engagement in the conventional sense of Facebook wanting to engage you for as long as possible or YouTube to have you watch their videos for as long as possible so that they can make money from you and what they know about you. This is an alternative. So coming to a couple of final sort of phases here, how does it all go together? Well, there's today's AI, which has these qualities and conversation, which has these other kinds of qualities. And my claim, is that cybernetics is this bilingual sensibility that's valuable to bring forward. So 
the interactions among these are many. There's a set of interactions and conversation across these and perhaps all together we can bring these and to address today I as a wicked problem. So we need a lot of conversations and I would propose that we need a new generation of Macy meetings, global and virtual now with cybernetics as the glue. So I suspect most of you, if not all of you know about the Macy meetings. They took place in the 1940s, 50s. Many, many experts. Yes, it was not necessarily a diverse group, but it was an intelligent conversation that occurred and they started a revolution. I would claim it was largely because of the Macy meetings that cybernetics had the influence that it had. And that was the birth of the field. Again, about systems with purpose. Now these original Macy meetings changed the worlds of science and engineering and humanities. But I think we need a new Macy meetings to tame today's wicked problems and specifically the ones that I'm talking about. And if you do a comparison of the context of the original Macy's, then I would propose these are alternatives. Again, not to study deeply here, they're in the, in the deck. We've been active in this for a bit over a year. I started talking about this in March of 2020 as the pandemic hit number of wonderful individuals, only some of whom are credited at the end, have been involved. We've had some experiments, I've done some presentations, there are some documents to read, and we're on the right side now advancing a plan. You saw some of that in the earlier slide. Let's make examples of counters to digital algorithms, and let's get them out there. This is as pragmatic as I can be. This is using what I know and taking cybernetics as a basis to bring forward things. I'm particularly interested in Gen Z. So on a prior slide, it went by quickly. The original Macy meetings were transdisciplinary. Yeah, we got that, transdisciplinary, that's what we do. But also transglobal and diverse and transgenerational. We're right now reaching out to small groups to understand better what the worldview is of people of that age and to bring them into the conversation. And I'm also seeking to build a network network of organizations and individuals and continuing to build the advisory council. These are the current members of the advisory council, beginning to be diverse, more to go, more to follow. So I'm almost done and I would like to open it up to your critique and your suggestions and perhaps even your participation. But first, let me just recap. Today I've argued that digital culture is a problem because that's what is inside of today's AI and it's one of the things that contributes to the pandemic. Human experiences of these very important ideas are compromised. These three eyes, interaction, information, and intelligence become a kind of place to start, if you will. It's the place where I started and my colleagues have started. I'd love to hear other places to start and other ways to go from here. And to build on top of alternative definitions of those three eyes, to create interactional frameworks that are organic and conversational and humane. I claim that cybernetics offers a basis for this, a bilingual sensibility to bridge the analog and the digital. And we're not just gonna talk about it, we're gonna build stuff and put that stuff out there. Offer it to curricula in interaction design, service design, design of design, uh, schools, designers, engineers, coders, businesses. And my feeling is the urgency of all of the above means that we need to convene new conversations in a new network. If we don't, who will? So let's bring about this rich mesh of collaborations across all of these 
distinctions that we don't want. We want the diversity and range. But let's also be deliberate about what we wish to conserve, invoking Maturana here. What do we want to keep before we make something new? What do we want to conserve as part of our analog and biological roots as social beings? And then use the technology to serve those principles rather than say, hey, what's new? That's great. Let's see. Uh oh, unintended consequences. Anyway, so we are excited to see what can emerge. Please join us. Thank you very much. I'd love to open it up to questions. So now we have to manage. How do you join? Uh, write to me, to my email. That's P Pangaro, P P A N G A R O. At, whoops, I'm typing on the wrong machine. That won't work. Sorry, hold it. Uh, oiled. That's funny. Give me a moment to recover. There we are again. Okay. I'm going to put my email in the chat. And I'll put you on a mailing list and I'll keep you aware of what's happening next. In particular, not just individuals, but organizations. Because I don't see the network as a hub and spoke or a hierarchy. Uh, I've started this in the context of the American Society for Cybernetics and many of its, many of the active people are from that society, but not only. But I don't want the hierarchy. I would like to see many different groups interested in things other than today's AI, other pandemics, other serious concerns. Um, so let's field questions. Um, I don't think it's too big a group. And it will be hard for me to both uh, track the chat and everything else. Uh, would, would anyone like to ask a question? Pre preferably by unmuting and asking. Ah. Jawahar, please. Hi, Paul. Uh, what, what an amazing uh, presentation. It actually woke me up. It's 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 past 1 a.m., 1.40 in Sydney over here right now, so you got me going. Uh, two, two quick observations, Paul. In, in one of your earlier slides, you highlighted all the failures of society, engineering failed, psychology failed, and so on. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and while you were talking through, I was sort of thinking, you know, why did they fail? And, and what was the options you were putting forward. And, and the fundamental difference between the objective, uh, so the AI and, and, and the analog is the conversation. And, and why conversation works, and, and this is just me thinking here, was because it is, it is a means that allows us to share our mental models, our abstractions of, of what's going on and to grow those abstractions mutually. Whereas the way AI is structured right now, that that mental model is not shared right the the model that that is in the algorithm is in the algorithm and and we can only get to that mental model through inference of the results that we get as opposed to asking so it and and so if you go back to the fundamentals that's what's sitting underneath it's 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 being able to share those mental models so that's just just one thought and the other one was on on focusing ai on efficiency and not effectiveness so it's about energy, about, about minimizing energy, but not where, where value comes in. The value bit requires that sharing of mental models because it has to be authenticated. The, the reason engineering you know, fails, for example, is because we, don't, we aren't able to share or we didn't share those conceptual mental models efficiently and effectively across a group. And therefore we didn't come up with the best model for what the system was and it, and it ended up failing. Uh, so, so really just, just two thoughts on that really catalyzed a lot of thinking there, Paul. The, the concept of why conversations are important, it's about mental models, and about perhaps thinking how efficiency and effectiveness comes into the mix over here, energy and value. Very beautiful. Thank you very much. The shared mental models uh, insight is, I think, very, very important. And of course, conversation is the only way to do that. Yes, and yes. Conversation theory, of course, and Pasky and machines are very much about that. But I appreciate you, and I appreciate you forefronting that in that way. That can be also a very specific targeted idea 
Um, mm -hmm. My emphasis here has been, um, how do you share it with the device mental yes. model? Yes. But how do we share mental models with each other is a beautiful expansion. Thank you. Other questions or comments? Sure. Um, I, I was a little bit disappointed because I thought you'd be more ambitious. So wow. instead of instead of talking about conversations, I thought I anticipated what you were going to say, and I thought, oh, probably grow, live, and die. You know, birth, and you know, much more organic conception, much more biological conception, rather than merely a conversation that literally two computers can have in some sense of conversation. And you know, so I mean, I understand what you what you mean by conversation, but you mean something much more than a mere exchange of sentences. I was also a little bit disappointed that you only talk about bilingualism. Uh, many people are trilingual, four languages, five languages, six languages. We, mean, we need many more languages than two and not just two at a time. You know, sometimes in Europe you have a conversation, there's four languages going on around the table and most people understand most of most of those languages. So it's fine. So, so to get out of this bilingualism, problem move beyond that. I think you can afford to be more ambitious. And then one small comment is that uh, computer systems, even, even the ones that you are suggesting and even the ones thought about by cyberneticians uh, are based on a particular, particular concepts of logic where mass nouns are, are um, badly captured because we think in terms of, of count nouns, right? Objects, objects that are delineated, that are fixed, that are static. And then we try to make something like a more fluid, like a mass noun or something. And I think you, what one really needs is to change the underlying logic, the underlying symbolic notation. And I, I have a suggestion for that, but we can exchange on that by uh, email or something. Please, I would love to hear more about that. Um, regarding your comments, um, as I said at the beginning, I'm a pragmatist. And mm -hmm. because I expect to address communities who might not be interested in the full life cycle from birth through death. Well, they and, become quite interested when they, when they're, when they start dying. <laughs> oh, they, oh, they don't think that way. They're gonna be immortal. They're gonna upload their consciousness. So I'm a pragmatist and I'm trying to focus on somewhere that I have expertise and that I think I can be convincing. Um, I appreciate that we need to be more than bilingual. My use of that phrase here was only in reference to analog and digital. If there are more in that scope, I would love to hear about them and to expand it. But that was the reason why that was limited there. Um, and I appreciate completely that uh, we need more verbs and fewer nouns. Thank you very much for that. Tomas, do you have a question? Uh, yes, uh, uh, thank you for, for the uh, presentation. Just very good, very precise, uh, pointing to the problem. Especially, I can see this kind of problem. We uh, actually can feel it, especially happened uh, uh, in Hong Kong here. Uh, is that uh, uh, things like uh, uh, these uh, media are trying to, because of you say, uh, they focus on transaction, so the AI actually reduce the conversation. Uh, we say in uh, system science, we always try to uh, 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 have you know, identify the spectrum and then try to balance the spectrum. Okay, uh, either are we going to more individual or are we individualism or collectivism? But uh, the, the AI, what it's doing is that it only uh, uh, want you to hear what you originally say you want to hear. And then it's shifting you more and more towards one side of the spectrum. And at the same time, it's the same for the other group. And they shift the other group and more and more onto the other side. And then they never hear anything uh, on their Facebook on the other side. And they thought, well, oh, I'm right. What I'm saying is right. And then when they really come into physical contact, when they need conversation, there is a big conflict uh -huh, because they thought they are right. I've been supported by all everything that I heard is, is on my side. So. So I, I remember when I was uh, as a young, I have to take uh, whether science or, 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 or art. Then uh, if I take science, I always have to take one uh, uh, subject of this uh, uh, art. And so I, I would say that uh, for these AI, at least you've got to have maybe 1% or 10% of other things that you are not interested so that to keep that conversation. 
Thomas, thank you. We have a number of questions, so I'll, I'll move on quickly. I agree with you about the polarization, the compensation bias uh, that's prevalent. And I, if you have alternatives to that, I would love to hear about them, uh, ways to approach those. It, it's, it's something I, it, it's, that is an unmet issue. Kevin. Hi, uh, you had a slide on things you've done and things to do and on things you've done, you had uh, something about design for action, I think it was, and on uh, things to do, design for variety. Could you talk about that? Uh -huh. You want me to talk about that further? Just, yeah, you know, what did you mean by those two design so, sure. statements? So design, design for variety means in the Ashby sense, if you're familiar with Ashby, is to design the next conversation with variety in mind. We have some goals for the next conversation. Who do we bring into it? Once we're in that conversation, we might realize along the way that we don't have sufficient variety. That's very likely. And therefore, we design the next conversation to include the variety that we feel we lack now. So that's what I mean by design for variety. Um, and I, there's a, I can send you a PDF on that if you want to let me know. Just write to me and I'll send yeah. it to you. Now there's um, design for action. Yes. Um, again, a paper uh, between Deverly and myself called Cybernetics and Design, colon, Conversations for Action. And that's available at Deverly.com. And the idea is that the conversations are prompts to act and not just conversations. And I try to exemplify that in this talk by saying, this is what I want to do. I mean, there are many societies, there are many Zoom calls, there's a lot going on and a lot of interest and energy. Uh, my goal is to be the pragmatist who brings it to action. So conversations for action is that metaphor. Thank you. Thank you. Um, James Bryant. Hi, Paul, thanks for that. It's very, very stimulating. Um, I'd like to suggest that, that, that we consider debunking and getting rid of the term AI. Uh -huh. Because there is no such thing really as artificial intelligence, it's machine learning. And, and, and making the distinction, perhaps by reflection as to what it is to be human, is to actually be able to learn from a greater variety than a machine has, because it is limited by the rules and its programming far more than we are as, as individuals and, and as a species. It just does something really, really well. I mean, I slightly incorrectly described it, but it's like having a machine savant, which, which is just really good at one thing that we're not terribly good at. And it potentially, it's, it's just an augmentation for some, a few things that we just can't do, like massive mathematical calculations of probability. Yes, I love the idea of replacing AI. Um, it's the term of art at the moment, or not art. Uh, but also to say that that's recognizable to everyone. And that's what I'm talking about. So when I say today's AI, I mean what people think of when they see that. But I love the idea of removing that as a term or supplanting it in the same way. So thank you for that comment. Yeah, as our counterinsurgency. Say again, sorry? As our counterinsurgency. Fair enough. Ru? Hi. Um, okay, so I was very interested in the point that you brought up around how we define engagement, uh, looking past like uh, social media networks like Facebook and YouTube. Um, so I'm kind of curious what that, how we would measure co-creation in terms of, um, you know, other forms of visual thinking or spatial thinking. Um, and you also brought up, I think you brought up coding as a, a way to measure engagement, but how does that, how do we um, incorporate ways of engagement that can look beyond these generational and cultural gaps around coding and systems literacy? That's a beautiful question. Um, I have a proposal for how to um, measure co-creation. It goes back to the idea of mental models in that if you can capture along the way of a conversation some trace, and if that trace represents the distinctions and relations that people have expressed, then that trace becomes an artifact of co-creation and possibly a measure of where the co-creation came from. Uh, I can send you a particular work on this, it's very crude, but the idea that if you can 
enshrine, that's a funny way of putting it, ideas into an external form, then you can measure it, right? So I, I, I like very much that you're onto the idea that measuring that is, is very, very important. I didn't mean to say to your second point, um, uh, the only thing I meant to say about code is that we write code to get machines to do things. And there's a codification of ideas and biases and values that are in that. And I just want to be completely conscious of that as we go about it. And I'm proposing an alternative set, an analog set. Does that answer your question, through? Oh, yeah. I mean, it definitely helps clarify. Um, and I, I'd love to follow up to right. read more about your work. Please write. I'd love to hear from anyone who's interested in pursuing the ideas, and I'm happy to offer more materials. Thank you. Elena. Oh, hi. Uh, really enjoyed the presentation. Thank you. Um, my question is, I wonder if there's any potential in looking back at some of the ideas that Gordon had and Stafford had about biological computers, now that we're more aware of things like the wood wide web and the potential communication among our gut bacteria. It's a wonderful idea. Elena's referring to this extraordinary work that, that Stafford Beer and Gordon Pask did sometimes together and sometimes apart of using biological creatures, literally organisms and their behaviors to, for example, in the ultimate uh, idealistic extreme to control a steel mill. Uh, I'm not making this up. So imagine creatures that normally live in a pond controlling a giant industrial process. That was the nature of those ideas. And they're very, very worth looking at and going back to. Thanks for that reminder, Elena. Robert. Yeah, we had, we had a meeting <clears throat> yesterday talking about the, uh, the sort of what I call the disintegration of Western civilization and the problems that we're facing. And one of the things that we tended to agree on uh, was that uh, our current mechanistic vision uh, based in materialism has to be relate, replaced by a more biological and organic view of, of, uh, of reality. That if you look at the two things uh, that you were talking about, the AI system, what is what, what, are the, what are those characteristics that you describe? They're the characteristics of mechanistic reductionism. And what are the uh, characteristics of a renewed, uh, a renewed uh, internet or AI? It's uh, returning to a biological understanding of things. So uh, I think absolutely you're, you're, you're on the right track. Uh, the two, the two uh, talks that I'm giving, the two papers that I'm giving are about uh, holism, moving from mechanistic reductionism to a more holistic understanding. And I think uh, absolutely, I'm on board. Anything I can do to help. Thank you, Robert. Much appreciated. And thanks for your comments. We've been asked to wrap up. Ben, would you like to be the closing commenter, questioner, critique, critiquer? Sure. Um, it's uh, just an, a kind of plus one for Elena's um, biological focus. And just to bring that back to maybe some of the things Michelle was saying. So I think the way you give uh, primacy to conversation as the, and in your understanding of conversation, as the framework, inevitably becomes quite a human-centered framework. And I think within that, I think there are questions about the question of what kind of logic it is. It might be useful to just think of that Bateson thing about different kind, you know, there's, we have conscious purpose, and then we have some activities, which maybe colloquy is a bit more like, you know, colloquy and the pizza, these are very different kinds of interactions right and and colloquy is a bit more like the kind of verb based logic that Bates and saying where we have that culturally we're participating in the stories of ecologies whereas the pizza in conversation about the pizza is kind of within the conscious planning framework 
And I think that um, reforming the conscious planning framework is important for a number of reasons, but okay. there's some, it's not what colloquy is about, I don't think. So I think you could pluralize your frameworks a bit. No, you've, you've expanded the idea there very much. I appreciate it. Uh, Robert, we really are running over. Is there something else you wanted to say or is that an old hand from you? Old hand, sorry, I should have taken it down. I, I thought it popped up a second time. Thank you everyone. I really appreciate your attention. Please write to me and let me know what you're thinking. Please join. Thank you. All the best.